for this set of notes, I have my notebook open to a spread and I am working on the right hand side of that. And I know that you don't have this image, but you can make this pretty easily um, by just like writing out the organism's names. But what we're gonna be doing for this side is we're gonna be talking about the cycling of matter. So when matter cycles, uh, matter cannot be created or destroyed, and we are going to be focusing on carbon for this. So first of all, I'm gonna start with my grass. How does grass acquire carbon? We know that grass is made up of a lot of carbon because it has all of those um, like glucose and cellulose uh, molecules, and those are primarily made of carbon. So it has to get that carbon from somewhere, and it gets the carbon primarily, well, totally, from the atmosphere. So in the atmosphere, we have our inorganic carbon, and I'm gonna draw a really big arrow because there is a lot of inorganic carbon, CO2, going into this grass. So this is inorganic and it's CO2. So that inorganic CO2 is going to go into the grass where it's going to be converted into organic carbon. Now some of that organic carbon is going to get transferred to my prairie dogs when my prairie dogs eat the grass. So I'm gonna draw a smaller arrow here because it's not actually all that much carbon that gets transferred into my prairie dogs. But the type of carbon that's transferred is organic. So things like that glucose, that cellulose, um, those biomolecules that are in the grass are then eaten by the prairie dog and that moves that organic carbon into the prairie dogs. But the grass doesn't only get eaten by the prairie dogs. dogs. Some of the grass is going to die and when the grass dies it gets sent to my decomposers in the soil and they're gonna break it down but it's still at this point organic carbon. And the grass also has to break down some of that organic carbon in order to release the energy from those high energy bonds. And that means that the grass is doing cellular respiration. And when the grass does cellular respiration, some of that carbon is going to get released as CO2 and it's going to come back into our atmosphere as inorganic carbon. And that's always going to be our CO2. Now what you should have is you should have all of this carbon that goes into the grass has to go somewhere. It doesn't get destroyed. So if I were to add up this carbon and this carbon and this carbon, it should equal the amount of carbon that went into that grass in the first place. All right, let's take a look at the next thing, our prairie dogs. Now our prairie dogs do some cellular respiration. And so they are going to release some of the carbon that they receive back into the atmosphere as CO2. Notice that I'm making this arrow thinner because I have less total carbon. Some of that carbon went into that prairie dog of the carbon that went in. Some of it is going to be this inorganic carbon here released. And some of our prairie dogs are gonna die. You know, natural causes, old age. That's going to be organic carbon. 
because we're talking about the biomolecules that make up their body. And then some of my prairie dogs are going to get eaten by my ferrets. And so again, that's the organic carbon that makes up their bodies. So if I add up all those three carbon um, being released, it has to equal the amount of carbon going in. Now, as you can see, every time we move up this chain, we're going to get less and less carbon that's able to make it through. So the next time we've got this amount of carbon here going into my ferret, my ferrets do cellular respiration. And now I'm talking like a super thin, I'm actually not very good at drawing it, arrow. So our ferrets are doing some cellular respiration. Our ferrets are getting eaten. And our ferrets are gonna die. And now we've only got this little tiny bit of organic carbon that's able to make it to the foxes. And so one of the things that you're going to learn is that you actually can't really have more than about four or five organisms in a food chain. Because by the time you get to this fox, you've got so little carbon going in that it really can't support another level of predator. So this carbon here, we've only got a little tiny bit, so there can't be that many foxes because there just aren't enough ferrets for them to eat to sustain all of those foxes, which means you can't really have another predator on top of this making it more than four or sometimes five things in a food chain. Now foxes do some cellular respiration all organisms do. They're going to need to move. They're going to need to catch those ferrets. So this is that inorganic carbon. Foxes are also going to die, but we don't have a predator for them on this food chain, so we're going to leave that part blank. Okay, so this looks pretty good, but we're missing something because we have a little bit of carbon, a little bit of carbon, a little bit of carbon, a little bit of carbon. That does not actually equal all of this carbon here in the atmosphere. We know that atoms cannot be created or destroyed. This makes it look right now like all of that organic carbon ends up in my decomposers and my decomposers just hold on to it forever. Well, they don't. Decomposers, things like bacteria and those pill bugs and things that we think of that live in the soil that are going to break down like the leaves of the um, trees or pieces of grass. Um, those decomposers are needing energy and the way that they get that energy is through cellular respiration. So any of this carbon that's going into the decomposers will eventually end up being released back into the atmosphere as CO2 when those decomposers do cellular respiration. So this is inorganic and it's CO2. And this is a simple carbon cycle that shows how this matter is moving around. All right, on this side of the page, kind of right in the middle, I'm gonna take just a few notes about this. So the important thing here is we're talking about matter and matter cycles. It gets reused. And that's going to be really important for an ecosystem. There are some processes that are involved in making it so that this carbon can get moved around these cycles. And one of those processes is photosynthesis.
Now, photosynthesis moves inorganic CO2 into the plant from the atmosphere. And this inorganic CO2, so I'm just going to say the CO2 at this point, you should know that it's inorganic. The CO2 is used to make organic carbon. And that organic carbon is stored in the plant. So I'm going to say here, it's used to make the organic carbon that is stored in the biomolecules of the plant. All right. Now, that's one process. We've got some other processes here. The next process that we have is eating. And eating can be done either by the next organism in the food chain, so in this case, like my prairie dog, or my decomposers are also eating as well. So any of these lines going down or this line going across, that represents the process of eating. And eating, what it does is it moves organic carbon through the food chain. And then the last process that we have here is cellular respiration. And we spent a lot of time on cellular respiration, but it was a long time ago. So let's just refresh this. Cellular respiration moves organic carbon from the food chain into the inorganic carbon in the atmosphere. Okay, those are our notes on cycling of matter. Now I'm going to flip this page. And now I have my diagram again, but now we're going to be talking about energy. And energy doesn't cycle. Energy flows. Um, while it doesn't get used up because energy also can't be created or destroyed, it doesn't end up cycling back through. So let's see how this works. The energy that goes into grass is sunlight. And just like with my carbon, I'm going to need a lot of energy going into this grass because there's a lot of grass. Now, that sunlight energy that's in the grass gets converted. So sunlight energy goes into the grass. The grass converts that sunlight energy into the high energy bonds in our, its biomolecules. So things like glucose, cellulose, proteins, um, even DNA have carbon to carbon or carbon to hydrogen bonds. So they have chemical energy. And it's this chemical energy in the bonds of the organism, 
uh, in their molecules that gets passed on to the next thing in the food chain. So this is chemical energy. And if the plant dies, those biomolecules are still part of the plant until they get decomposed. And so they get transferred to decomposers. It's still chemical energy. Because it's still in those biomolecules. But grass does cellular respiration. Those plants do cellular respiration in order to use their energy. That energy helps them grow, it helps them move, it helps them build molecules, it helps them break molecules down. And when they do cellular respiration, cellular respiration releases energy That energy is kinetic energy. And it's in the form of heat and motion. So plants convert sunlight energy into chemical energy, which can then move up the food chain or into kinetic energy when they do cellular respiration, and that's energy that they are then using. But it's still getting released as heat or motion. Now prairie dogs, they've got this smaller amount of chemical energy going into them because not all of the biomolecules that the grass made end up going into the prairie dog. Some of them get broken down, some of them end up in grass that dies. So a smaller amount of chemical energy moves into my prairie dogs. Let's play this out. Prairie dogs do cellular respiration. So some of that energy that goes in as chemical energy is being converted into kinetic energy. Again, it's heat and motion, but I'm not gonna keep writing that. Some of those prairie dogs get eaten. When the prairie dogs get eaten by the ferrets, that chemical energy in the biomolecules move into the ferrets. The ferrets are eating those biomolecules, which means we still have chemical energy. And when those prairie dogs, if they're not eaten, they'll die. When that gets passed on to the decomposers, it's still in the form of biomolecules, so we're still talking chemical energy. All right, ferrets are getting this smaller amount of chemical energy. Ferrets are doing some cellular respiration. So that's gonna be released as kinetic energy. Some of them are being eaten. That's moving chemical energy. And some of them don't get eaten, manage to live to a ripe old age, and then they die and are decomposed. So that is also chemical energy. Last but not least, we have our foxes. As you can see, just like with our matter, our energy is getting reduced each time we go through here. And so we've got only this little amount of chemical energy that ends up in the foxes. Those foxes might die, moving that chemical energy to the decomposers, or they also move around a lot. They use up some of that energy, converting it into kinetic energy when they do cellular respiration. Now all of these decomposers, they're getting all of this chemical energy. They are also doing cellular respiration. So a whole bunch of energy is actually going to be released from the decomposers as kinetic energy. And that's when they're doing cellular respiration. And this is a lot of heat and motion and so if you have like a compost bin um, and you do composting at your home 
or you've seen composting happen, then you know that those compost bins release a lot of heat. They actually steam quite often when it's cold outside because you can then see how much heat is being released. And that's because those decomposers are doing cellular respiration. A compost pit can actually get so hot that it can light itself on fire. So if you are composting, you do have to be a little bit careful. All right, on this next page, we're gonna talk about these processes. So we've got our saying here, energy flows. It does not get reused. And we can do this pretty quickly now. So we've got our processes, we've got our photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is going to take sunlight energy and it's gonna convert it into chemical energy. Our next process is eating. We're gonna have the same processes as before. And eating is going to take that chemical energy and it's still going to be chemical energy. And that's because we still have biomolecules here and biomolecules here. They've just been made into smaller biomolecules, say going from a polymer to a monomer. Our last one is cellular respiration. Now, cellular respiration is going to take that chemical energy and it's going to convert it into kinetic energy. And we say that the energy at this point is lost. But it's not really lost because you can't create it or destroy it, but it does go into the environment. So it's lost into the environment. And we say that it's lost because it can no longer be used by those organisms in order to move, grow, break down molecules, that sort of thing. Um, it can't go back into our food chain. So once it's ended up as kinetic energy going into the environment, it can no longer come back into this food chain um, unless somehow like a lightning bug is able to convert it into light, but it can't. So you would need it to turn into light so that it can enter back in as grass. So energy is lost to the environment. So our key ideas here is that energy flows and matter cycles.